Welcome to Seaside Sermons, a ministry of ChristAssembly.org. My name is Bert Allen. I always like to start the videos by reminding people of the great love of Jesus Christ. He left the splendors of heaven, came down to earth, and on purpose went to the cross to die in my place and your place because we are all sinners who fall short of the glory of God. Then he was raised on the third day and he lives to forgive us of our sins and to give us eternal life and will be born again instantaneously by faith in him. If you want to know more about that, then stick around to the end of the video and I will stand in front of a Bricks background and share the best news you'll ever hear about how you can have that forgiveness from Jesus and eternal life. But for now, let's dive into the study. We've been in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 studying about friendship. And a large part of friendship from a biblical standpoint is that we abstain from immorality. We don't have sex with our friends. We don't have sex with anybody unless we're married, one male to one female, with that person, our spouse. God says we need to learn to abstain from immorality. And he means both in our mind, in our hearts, and in with our bodies. Often we see things, and then we have a desire, and then that desire produces action. And it's all evil. Once you start down that road of, I see it, I desire it, I want it, and then I'm going to act on that, that is all evil. We should distinguish a temptation where you look and you see something and you go, yes, that's sexually attractive, and it stops right there and you don't go an inch farther. You rely upon God to provide the way out of that to escape that temptation and you move on praising God. You don't have to be like that anymore. Remember, Jesus said, even if you look and desire in your heart to do adultery or immorality, in our case here in this passage, it's as if you've done the physical act. Your heart is corrupt. So let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and today we'll look at verse 8 in more detail. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. So God says that we've been called for the purpose of sanctification, to be made holy. And we know from John 17 that the word of God sanctifies us, but we also know from our study in 1 Thessalonians that the Holy Spirit produces his work of making us holy before God in our lives. So you've probably heard Lots of people tell you, if you love somebody, it's completely okay to have sex with them. As a matter of fact, you can have sex with anybody you want of any sex or gender you want and do anything you want at any time you want. They urge you to live in freedom of sexuality, except God doesn't call it freedom of sexuality. He calls it immorality. And he says it's serious stuff. And Paul's just spent these verses in chapter 4 urging the Thessalonians to live in sanctification and abstain from immorality. Combating that are all the people around there saying, no, no, do whatever you want, whenever you want sexually. And God says, okay, when people are telling you that, and there can even be people inside the church telling you, do whatever you want, whenever you want sexually. But when they're saying that, remember verse 8 says, people who reject this teaching that you should not engage in immorality, but you should be called and live in sanctification and abstain from immorality across the board. God says when people reject that teaching, they're not rejecting the teaching of a man like Paul. They're rejecting God and specifically God, the Holy Spirit, and his teaching. Think about how powerful that is, that God's looking at us and saying, if you claim to be a believer and you reject this idea of living in sanctification, know how to possess your body, know how to stay away and abstain from immorality. If you have people telling you, don't worry about your immorality, it'll be okay, ignore it, embrace it, do whatever you want, whenever you want, Number one, it isn't a man commanding you to abstain from immorality. It's God. And specifically in this verse, the Holy Spirit's prompting you to abstain from all that stuff. You know, if you have questions about why is my life really not progressing in Christ, 
Is it because even in your mind or in your act or both, you're still living in immorality? One good gauge of that is pornography. If you're watching pornography and engaging in any form of pornography, rest assured you're not living in sanctification. You're living in immorality. And, well, wait, I just watch it on YouTube or I watch it somewhere on the Internet or a porn site or somewhere. Yeah. Remember, pornography doesn't have to be full nudity. It's anything that's going to cause you to have an immoral reaction. That immorality is what God's talking about here. That lust in your heart, whether it produces overt action or not, it's still immorality in your life. It's that evil desire to engage in it. God says, man tells you that's okay. God says it's not. The Holy Spirit works to sanctify you and help you abstain from all immorality. But when people say, oh, you don't have to worry about that. You go, no, I remember what God said. I'm not rejecting man. I'm rejecting the Holy Spirit. And that's a big deal. I'm be grieving the Holy Spirit by engaging in any form of immorality, by looking at pornography, by indulging my mind and my heart's desire for evil things. God says, if you're going to be a really good friend, you've got to learn to distinguish between what men are telling you and what the Holy Spirit's telling you. You need to, number two, identify the people who are rejecting the work of the Holy Spirit in their life. Mark that man or that woman and say, no, that person rejects the Holy Spirit. How do I know that? First Thessalonians 4, eight told me that the people who reject that claim of God upon your life, that you live in the power of the Holy Spirit, you do not grieve the Holy Spirit, but you are filled with the Holy Spirit. You're not quenching the Holy Spirit, but you're walking in order with the Holy Spirit. Well, if you want to know more about that stuff, go read Galatians 5. But here's the point. There's going to be a war going on in your life between what the flesh wants to do with its immorality and what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life. But if you live in immorality, even in your mind, you're going to be a danger to your friends. The danger is that you're always looking for immorality and more immorality. Your friends are not safe. You've rejected God. You're rejecting the teaching of God. You're rejecting the Holy Spirit's work in your life when you have a heart set upon immorality, even if it's only occasional lapses. Make sure you're trying to get to zero, where you have zero days of lapses. No lapses, no immorality, no bad thoughts, no overt acts. Praise Jesus. We know that when he says in verse 8, they're not rejecting men, but they're rejecting the Holy Spirit. That's telling us on the positive side that the Holy Spirit's working inside of us all the time to help us lay aside immorality, to walk in the Spirit, to be filled with the Spirit, to see Him producing the fruit of the Spirit in our life every day to the glory of God. And we'll be the best friends ever because we abstain from immorality. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and how clean and pure and wonderful it is. It is truly beautiful. Lord, help us to abstain from immorality and to make sure that we're not rejecting the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We pray in the matchless, beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Before I close the video, I'd like to share with you four verses about eternal life. I often ask people this simple question. Why should Jesus let you into heaven? And the answer to that question surprises many people because it comes from the Bible and it's simple and it's clear. Most folks, when they hear that question, they tell me, well, I've been good or tried to do more good than bad or I tried hard or I've done a lot of nice things and I hope God will let me into heaven. They somehow think if their good works outweigh their bad works that God will let them in. But God says, actually, I'll let people into heaven because of a free gift. But the story from Jesus starts with four verses, and I'm going to read them one at a time. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 You see, for every person who lives today on earth in human flesh, we've all sinned, every one of us. We've all told a lie. We've all 
done or said something that made somebody else angry and we were doing it out of anger ourselves. We've all done things to hurt other people at one time or another. God says that's all sin and I look upon that as falling short of my glory, God says. God says we should never fall short of his standard, which is the glory of God. Well, is it serious that we've sinned? Should I be worried about that? Everybody sinned. Why should I worry? Well, consider Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death that all of us deserve the death penalty. At the moment we sin, we incur the death penalty for the smallest sin or the biggest sin. I'm happy that Romans 3, 20, 6, 23 continues and says, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, if you've been listening carefully and thinking about what the Bible says, so far we've learned that we're all sinners, we all fall short of the glory of God, and we all deserve the death penalty. This doesn't sound like good news until you read the last part of that last verse. It says that God has a free gift for all of us. It's in Christ Jesus our Lord and it's eternal life. The free gift of eternal life that only Jesus Christ can give you. He said he's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. Why would God offer us this great gift if we're all sinners? Well, Romans 5, 8 tells us, it says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us. He died in our place. God loves sinners like you and like me. He died in my place and in your place. He paid the death penalty for me. I often illustrate the free gift like this that I have this old Nissan truck. It has 285,000 miles on it. It's not that great a truck. It sits at the beach every day. But I illustrate the point this way. I hold up the keys to my truck and I say, I'm going to make you a symbolic gift of my truck. But until you take the keys out of my hand, it's not your truck yet. Well, let me tell you what I mean. A lot of people have been going to church for years. They know all about Jesus. They can quote verses about Jesus. But they know in their heart that they're not quite right with God. And there's never been a day in their life where they've been born again and they know it. You see, they're just staring at the keys in God's hand and he's offering you the free gift today of saying, reach out by faith and receive that free gift and take it into your heart today. Receive the free gift. Okay, how do we do that? Well, Romans 10.9 tells us how to do that. It says that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And he means saved from the death penalty, eternal destruction. So we can receive that free gift right now by faith, and we can pray a prayer together. I urge you to pray with me. I'm going to pray it right now. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you love me. I confess that I am a sinner and I fall short of the glory of God. I confess too that I deserve the wages of sin, which is death. But Lord, you offer me the free gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I accept that free gift right now. I believe that you love me and that God died on the cross for me, that Jesus Christ is God, and he died on the cross for me. You paid the death penalty for me, Lord Jesus. Thank you so much. I confess with my mouth Jesus is Lord, and I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. I repent of my sins, and I accept that free gift, Lord. Thank you so much that you have forgiven me, in your name I pray. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, I'd love you to send me an email and we'll rejoice together. Send me the email at friend at christassembly.org. That's friend at christassembly.org. I look forward to hearing from you. Hallelujah. <laughs>
Scripture quotations taken from the NASB, New American Standard Bible, copyright 1995 by the Lockman Foundation. Used by permission, all rights reserved.